I'm grateful to be here with you, and we're talking about this wonderful text. The author was in prison, and he was writing to a group of people who were not part of a movement that was part of the cultural ascendancy. He's writing to an audience that is not part of some new popular sect that is taking the world by storm. No, like the author who is in prison for his faith, they too are facing opposition and affliction and persecution and suffering. They need to know They need to know about this this community that they are a part of, this community of Christ followers. And in the throes of this challenge and opposition and affliction and suffering that they're facing, they need a vision. Not a small vision. Not a minor vision. That would not be up to to, to the task given what they are facing. They need a grand vision. We feel that a little bit in our moment. We feel a little awash in a tumultuous and churning sea. And I think we too need a vision. A grand vision that lifts us out of the circumstances, the the horizon of our present circumstances that sometimes can be stifling to us, discouraging to us. We need a grand vision that lifts us out of that and above that. Well, with that, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. We will pick up where... Dr. Parsons left off. We will be at verses 7 to 10. Ephesians 1, verses 7 to 10. In him, the immediate referent is Paul's expression for Christ as the beloved. In Christ, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him. Things in heaven and things on earth. This is God's word. May he bless it in our midst this evening. The vision is as grand as it gets. The uniting of all things. And the catalyst for that vision is this phrase, in him. In fact, it are these uh, two phrases, in him and all things that are ricocheting throughout these verses, throughout this entire chapter. If you were to trace the references to in him or in Christ or in the beloved, 13 times in chapter 1, we have that phrase repeated again and again and again. And if we look for the phrase all things, we find it four times in this chapter. And if we look at the concept and various ways to express the concept, we find it even many more. It's as if Paul has a pinball machine and he keeps hitting tilt as he's racking up the points for these two phrases. And he uses these phrases in such a way in these verses as to give us extreme and epic language. You can feel it, can't you? You can sense it. It's not just God's grace, that would be enough to say. No, Paul says what? The riches of God's grace. And then it's not just the riches of God's grace, but they are lavished upon us. 
poured out upon us in wave upon wave, shower upon shower of God's grace. And then it's not this dirt, this plot, this landmass. It's not this planet. It's all things. To the ancients, it was the stars that could be seen with the eye. For us, it's the Hubble telescope beaming back images of galaxies. And our understanding of this universe, as vast as it is, is yet an infinitesimal sense of the grandeur and the vastness. And this is part of the vision. All things, as grand as it gets. Well, let's unpack these two phrases and all of their meaning. In him and all things. Uh, first, in him, just in these verses that we have. What does it mean to be in Christ? First, it means in him we have redemption. And for each of these, we're going to see we need to consider the opposite. So the opposite of redemption is bondage. Uh, the opposite of redemption is slavery. And so to the Old Testament saint, the image, the, the, the example is the exodus. It's the mantra of the Old Testament. Remember the exodus. Remember the exodus. A time of real slavery of Israel. Under the thumb of Egypt and the oppression of Pharaoh. And they were redeemed out of that slavery by blood. The blood of a lamb, spotless, that was pasted on the doorframe. And they were redeemed as the angel passed over and they were brought out of the land. And as we see that phrase and as Paul gives us that phrase, we know that our event is the cross. And so we are redeemed from bondage, from slavery through his blood. And notice that that beautiful reference Paul has for Christ in verse 6. It is the beloved. It is the blood of God's only begotten Son. That unbroken fellowship. That eternal bond of perfect love. Uniting the members of the Trinity. That's the Son that God sent. In Him, in Him, we are redeemed. And the price was the blood of Christ. In Him, we have forgiveness. And, and what is the, the opposite of forgiveness but an offense, a transgression, a, a crossing over? And the opposite of forgiveness is, is guilt. And the opposite of forgiveness is shame. And so when we were not in him, when we were not in Christ, when we were not a child of God, but a child of wrath, as Paul himself describes us in just a few verses away in chapter 2, by nature, children of wrath, in Adam, we have guilt and shame. And guilt is not a construct it's not a holdover from some Victorian culture that we just need to simply rid ourselves of, get over. It is real because the offense is real and we know that we stand guilty before a holy God. And we feel the shame of it and the weight of it and the burden of it. There's a scene in Milton's Paradise Lost 
where at the fall, Adam and Eve, never a harsh word passed between them. Never an unkind word. Never a hidden agenda. Pure, pure love and a harmonious relationship passed between Adam and Eve. Until that precise moment. And they turn on each other. And Milton has Adam and Eve against each other turning on each other. And what does Adam say? It was the the woman that you gave me. The the brashness that sin brings in us. But then Milton has Adam put his arm around Eve as they are expelled from the garden. And he says, arise and let us go. Adam says to his mate, condemned enough already. We feel the weight and the burden and the guilt and the shame and the condemnation. And then there is this beautiful gift that God gives us of forgiveness. Of forgiveness. But not, not cheaply attained. Uh, not capriciously given. And not arbitrarily doled out. But as we just heard, attached to God's plan before the ages. His plan that was predestined for us. Uh, In Christ we have redemption from bondage through the blood of Christ. In Christ we have forgiveness of our guilt and shame and condemnation and trespass and transgression. And in him we have grace. And what is the opposite of God's grace but God's wrath? And so we have this expression, don't we? Of the cup of God's wrath and the pouring out of God's wrath and the pouring out of God's wrath upon his enemies and the psalmist at times so overwhelmed by the enemies of God, so driven by the desire for God's name to be be revered, that he cries for God's enemies to be judged, for God to pour out his wrath on his enemies. And we have this image in the Old Testament, don't we? And then we come to the garden and this agonizing moment of Christ's prayer for this cup This cup that has been filled by the the sin of humanity against the creator. He pleads that it, that it pass, that there be another way. But he knows and with a resolution he, he, he stands up and he makes his way to the cross. And God pours out the cup of his wrath on his beloved son. But we don't get that. Our substitute gets that. He endured that. In our place. And because he endured that in our place, this is what gets poured out upon us. The grace of God. And as, as there will be no shortage of God pouring out his infinite wrath upon his enemies, there is no shortage of God's infinite grace. And so Paul has every right to use the language that he does, the riches lavished upon us. 
In him we have redemption. In him we have forgiveness. In him we have grace. This is our identity. This was so crucial, one's identity in the first century. Oh, to be a Roman. And the privileges that accorded being a Roman. I can't help but think of my dear friend sitting right here in the front row, Dr. Thomas, who became a citizen of these United States. But yet, the queen never relinquishes her subjects. <laughs> and so, indeed, you remain a citizen of the United Kingdom of the Queen. And there are privileges attached to that, are there not, Dr. Thomas? Indeed, absolutely. And they absolutely pale in comparison to the privileges of our identity of being in Christ. What, what Roman citizenship meant. And, and not everybody had it. But your identity, how that meant, how that mattered to you. And here he's telling these Ephesians, these Romans, oh no, there is a far better identity for you. Your identity is of Christ's. You belong to Christ. You are his possession. Now, the doctrine here is that beautiful doctrine that the reformers loved to teach on and preach on and tell us about union with Christ. And union with Christ means all that is his is ours. And union with Christ means that as we are in him, and he and the Father are one, and Christ is in the eternal triune God, we too enter into fellowship with the triune God through our identity in Christ, our elder brother. Oh, this grand vision of being in him. It's our identity. And then we get to this grand vision of all things. Now let's think about this for a little bit and, and let's go back to that garden because let's go back to see what we lost and see all that is encompassed in the fall so that we can then clearly see what is going on in all things. And so the first thing that is fractured, that is broken, is our relationship with God. And so immediately, Adam and Eve, once enjoying the walking with God in the cool of the evening now are hiding from God. They're hiding from God because they are cut off from Him. They are separated from Him. The theological word here is alienation. They are a foreigner, a stranger. They are cast aside. They're an outsider. That once harmonious, peaceful relationship between God and man is now fractured at its very core. And there is now not a union and a united to God, but a division and a separation and a fractured and a brokenness. And then we already mentioned it, that union that existed between Adam and Eve, that perfect harmony in their relationship is now fractured. And Adam turns on Eve and Cain slays Abel, and soon the wickedness of man pours across the earth as violent men act violently 
upon others. And so we are even alienated from each other. And there is not a union, but a fracture. And things are not united, but broken. And there is even a fracture in the relationship of man to nature. And so there was work in the garden. They were farmers. I'm sure there's some Dutch farmers out there. The fan club of Dr. Godfrey is out there somewhere. And I don't know exactly how this worked, but somehow Adam and Eve worked without toil. Somehow they worked without strife. But not after the fall. Now thorns would infest the ground. And now work would be white knuckle by the sweat of the brow. And now we are in a conflict of man against nature. That act of sin ruptured all things. That act of sin broke all things. And so in Christ... What is this grand vision but to unite all things? Now think about this. Let me illustrate it this way. Let's say you're a a worker bee in a major corporation. Or you're even mid-management or upper management in a massive corporation. And you want to know, why why do I do this every day? What's the vision? Uh, Why why do I work hard? Why do I exert effort? Why do I care? And the, the boss, the CEO, invites you to come to his office to tell you personally I'm going to let you in on a mystery. I'm going to let you in on my plan. My secret plan. of My vision for this company. Before this illustration to work, uh, this boss has to own everything. Single shareholder of the company. And not only that, but the, the boss has to own everything Vertically, including you, and not just the time you're at work, but your very life. And, and not only that, but this boss has to own everything horizontally, and he has to own everything horizontally at every single level vertically. Every supply chain, every raw material, every distribution channel, every product, every customer. Now the illustration And he invites you to sit in his office. And he's going to tell you the grand vision. Or let's make it a military illustration. And you're a foot soldier or a sergeant. And the general, no, the commander in chief. No, the the one who actually made everything, the armaments, the weaponry, controls everything. He invites you for a meeting to tell you, you, the vision. This is what Paul is telling us. It's the mystery of his will. Now, you need to catch this. 
the pronoun switched. It switched back in verse 7. In him is Christ. We have redemption through his blood. That's still Christ. So forgiveness of our trespasses. I think now the pronoun switches to God the Father. According to the riches of God's grace. Which God lavished upon us. In all wisdom and insight. Making known to us the mystery of God's will. According to God's purpose. Which God set forth in Christ. So this is the mystery of the divine mind. This is what philosophers have spent millennia investigating. Why are we here? What are we doing here? Where are we going? What is the point of all this? This is it. Uh, This is what Plato spent his life pursuing. This is it. This is the whole task of, of Western philosophy right here. It's his will. It's his plan. It's his purpose. And it is this. To unite all things in Christ. And we're back to Christ. To unite all things in the beloved Son. Earlier we spoke on the Great Commission, and there it is. All authority has been given to me. Authority in heaven and authority on earth has been handed over to the Son. And now, through Christ's work, His finished work, His completed work, His work that the Father accepted, and we know that because the Father, and this is Paul's doctrine, you can trace this out in Paul's epistles, God resurrected Jesus from the dead. God resurrected Jesus from the dead. Accepting his sacrifice on our behalf. And all things are united. And our mind goes off to Revelation 21, doesn't it? And there's God seated on the throne, this grand vision. And behold, I am making all Things new. And we roll into the end of chapter 21 where the the kings of the earth bring their glory into this majestic city. And then we move into chapter 22 and where are we? We're back in the Garden of Eden. And there's a tree and there's a river and there's fruitfulness. But there are some differences now. One main one. There's no greater light And lesser light. There is no need of it. For it is the glory of God that is at the center of this new world. Oh, and then there is a massive, a massive difference now. There is no sin. There are no tears. There is no sorrow. There is no death. There's no decay, there's no fracture, there's no brokenness, there's no strife, there's no conflict, there's no man against God, there's no man against man, there's no man against nature. For all things, all things are united in the Son. And all things have been made new. This is the vision. It is the vision for the fullness of time for the fulfillment of God's plan of the ages, and he led us in on it. He brought us in and sat us down and put us across the table and said, here's my plan. Here's my vision. And you are part of it. 
You are in it. Wouldn't it be great if we just sat in this place and sang hymns together all the time and listened to great preaching from people with Welsh accents all the time and have a bookstore and free coffee. We have everything we need in this place. Wouldn't it be great if we just talked about these grandiose themes all the time and celebrated? But do you know what we have to do? We have to go out there. Here's the Ephesians. Gathered together. Can you imagine, can you even imagine the excitement of hearing that Paul has sent an epistle and it's going to be read this Lord's Day in the house churches in the city of Ephesus? Can you imagine? And they sit there and they're pinching themselves. Is this what? And line after line, Verse after verse, chapter after chapter. What a great vision. And then you know what? Service comes to an end. And they've got to go back out there. Uh, because the battle is raging. And they're, they're pressed into service. And they're going to get bruised. And they're going to get Ephesian dust on their shoes. And they're going to be in a hostile world. But now they know. And now they know who they are. And now they know the plan. They know the vision. We need this. We so desperately need this. We get caught up in our horizon and we get discouraged and we need joy and we need hope and we need meaning and we need encouragement and we need perspective and that's exactly what we get here. Our hearts should be filled with praise every time we look at Ephesians chapter 1. What a grand and glorious chapter this is. Do you know that Calvin got so excited preaching on, on the book of Ephesians that at one point while he was preaching through the book of Ephesians, he burst a blood vessel. Our beloved Calvin, reserved man that he is, How can we not read this and our hearts be filled with praise and joy and we need that and please get that and please return to this again and again and again and again. It's ballast. No, it's more than that. It's like, it's like you're in a sea and it's a raging storm but you're on an aircraft carrier. And they tell me that a single chain on the anchor of an aircraft carrier weighs 136 pounds. One chain. And that massive anchor and all of its chains is dropped to the bottom and you're not going anywhere. And the seas rage and the waves churn and you are safe and secure on your aircraft carrier. That's Ephesians chapter 1. And we need a vision, don't we? You need it? Don't you need? Why am I doing this? Why am I slugging away at this? And, and, and this business of integrity and honesty and compassion and this is hard work. And being a, a loving husband and being a loving father, this is hard work. And being a good employee an honest, hardworking employee, that's difficult. And being faithful in our Christian walk and reading the Bible and, 
And as, as Owen would say, mortifying sin. That is hard. It's a battle. It's hard work. And there it is, the grand vision. Now, Paul, Paul doesn't come along to the Ephesians and say, uh, chin up. You've got this. It's, it's, it's bad grammar. Let's first say that. You've got this. It's bad grammar. Let's start there. And it's really bad theology. So let's go there too. No, you don't have this. Jesus has you. But Paul he doesn't come along and say, chin up. Things will get better. Your day will brighten up. Your troubles will go away. You'll get a, a clean bill of health. Your financial situation will straighten itself out. Maybe that happens. Maybe it doesn't happen. But he doesn't say that to the Ephesians. He doesn't say in light of these difficult circumstances, this is going to happen to you and you'll be fine. He doesn't say that. In fact, you know what he actually says? If you, if you go over to, to 2 Timothy, you know what he says to Timothy? Things are really bad, Timothy. But be encouraged because things are going to get worse. <laughs> he actually says that. Things are going to go. It's really bad, Timothy. It's really bad. Things are going to go from bad to worse. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will face persecution. It will come. Adversity and hardship. It's hard, this Christian life. How does our beloved friend Bunyan portray Christian's journey but ups and downs and valleys and swamps and imprisonment and harassment and betrayal and disillusionment. It's hard. So we need a vision. We need a vision that gets us out of bed every day. We need a vision that has us report for duty, ready. And that's exactly what we get. It is precisely what we get in this chapter. A vision of all things united, all things in heaven and all things on earth. We can scarcely imagine what that looks like. We can scarcely imagine the glory that will be. We, we read of this climactic finish to it all in Revelation 21 and we are just filled with, with joy but filled with knowing that we can just barely trace the edges of, of what we are seeing. Uh, knowing that, yes, God has, has just opened up the divine mind and, and has just revealed to us his plan for the ages, and yet we only grasp it in miniature. We only sketch its edges. We only trace it faintly. But yet it is enough. Do you know one of the things Calvin did at Geneva, among many of the things he introduced, one was he locked the church doors. Now, part of that was to disabuse his people of the medieval superstitious notion that the only prayers that God would hear were the prayers that were offered in church. And behind that medieval superstition was indeed a financial motive because you would need to, to drop the coin 
in order to say the prayer in church. So Calvin locked the church door because he wanted his people not to think that they had to go to church to pray. God would hear their prayers wherever they are. But I'd like to think there was something else going on with Calvin locking the church door. Because he pressed his people into service. They gathered and they worshiped and they learned and they participated in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper together and they prayed and they sang and Dr. Godfrey would want me to tell you that they sang psalms in Calvin's Geneva and he'd want me to add that they sang psalms without musical instruments in Calvin's Geneva and their hearts were filled with joy and praise and hope and then they went out And they served. And they went into the battle. Well, that's our task. We will be bruised. We will get dust on our shoes. We will be afflicted and maybe even persecuted. But now we know. We know who we are. We know to whom we belong. And we know the plan. And it's glorious. Pray with me. Our Father and our God, we give thanks. Thanks for your beloved Son. Thanks for his work on the cross. We give thanks for our redemption, our forgiveness. We give thanks for your grace. And we marvel, we are overwhelmed when we think about it. How you have condescended to us. How you have revealed to us your plan to reconcile all that has been alienated to reconcile all things in Christ. May we be encouraged. May we be held up by these great truths. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.